The stories from the participant help us to take a look back into the not too distant past of what it was like growing up as a black person in their community and how much they compare or contrast to the events of the 21st century. History has shown us that blacks have been thought of as less than, inferior, inept. These negative views about what we are and who we are as a people are evident in the ways we were treated and are still being treated. How then can we expect a people that don't treat us right to ever teach us right? Let us take a look back on what occurred with Dr. Bruce. Regina Booz, also known as Dr. Booz. I am my parents' oldest child. They were 16 when I was born. Best housing we ever had was in the Harrison Court Projects in Chicago. Um, I spent formative years in that place from the time I was six until I was 14. But before that, I lived in um, Brooklyn uh, with my mom and some of her relatives. And one of the things that was outstanding about me when I was living in Brooklyn was I was a runaway. I learned how to get out of my crib, out of my bed, out of the apartment. And the adult said, that child, that child, you're not going to ever hold her back. And it's true. All of my life, I haven't been a runaway, but I've been an adventurer. Um, I think my, some of my fondest memories were living at uh, Harrison Court. I had a little group of friends. There were three groups, the baby group, which my sister was in, the middle kids, which I was in, and the teenagers, which I never belonged to that group. But we were always very adventurous. There was a, a, a vacant lot behind, across the alley, that in the wintertime, we built snowball forts and we actually did injure people because we would put rocks in our snowballs. Um, in the summertime, we played in the tall grass and we still played war and we threw rocks at each other. But we had a medical tent, usually somebody's mama sheep, <laughs> that we set up as a tent to take care of the injured. So we were a tight little group and no matter what we did to each other, all was forgiven. And that carried me through uh, life. No matter what you do, all can be forgiven if you so choose to. Okay. I'm 71. I grew up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the aughts. Oh my God, those were exciting. To, the I moved to California uh, when I was 17 because of the great snow in 1967, the day I graduated from high school. And I <laughs> had a graduation party at my house, and folks passed out because my mom gave us a quart of gin. And when we woke up the next morning, we were snowed in for three days. And at the end of the three days, with 10 teenagers dancing, singing, snowball fighting, eating, my mom said, that's it. And in June, she moved us to California, to Los Angeles. I think... Being in Los Angeles from 1967 until 2017 was fabulous. Black power movements, and there's an S on the end of that, black power movements were everywhere. There was a black cultural movement, there was a black revolutionary movement, there was just everything. Uh, there were festivals. There was two weeks of blackness in the park, <laughs> you know, where you ha actually had uh, bands, people come in to play, name people. Dick Gregory came to uh, our college, Cal State Hayward, for two weeks of blackness there. And it, it was really exciting times that we were, we had all kinds of struggles going on. We were dealing with racism. We were dealing with the Vietnam War. We were dealing with the idea of, okay, now that we've come of age and we can vote, who are we going to vote for? We don't like none of these people. <laughs> Like, no, no. 
Uh, I was part of the Black Students for Bradley campaign, Tom Bradley, African American, running for mayor in Chicago. The first, I'm not Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, first time he lost, but the second time we made sure he won and he stayed in office forever. And, you know, the excitement of, we call ourselves snipers, but we had a staple gun and a poster. <laughs> that said vote for Bradley and we would go into all those gated communities of the super rich they never did figure out how we got in and we would staple black students for Bradley we would sign vote for Tom Bradley they'd wake up in the morning and the whole community was covered in vote for Bradley campaign signs and the neighbors were accusing I knew you were voting for him I, that's not my sign I didn't put this up yes you did <laughs> They would call the campaign headquarters and they'd very slowly turn around and look. Come here. Y'all go back out there and remove those signs. We can't get in. Somebody's going to have to open the gate for us. <laughs> but we had to go and take down the signs. But the next night they'd be out there again. Um, people, African American people, we call ourselves African Americans, we call ourselves Afro Americans, we call ourselves black. We call ourselves sisters, brothers, blood, you know. So when you saw each other on the street, you spoke, you know, how you doing blood? And that wasn't gang related. That was, you know, blood of the kin. Uh, we were kin of the skin. How are you, how are you all related? Kin of the skin. Uh, what, what side of the family? Both sides. <laughs> we all got skin. And the, the idea of having skin in the game really meant that your problems are my problems. And so now we have problems that we have to solve. Uh, people could hitchhike. You could pick up somebody and give them a ride. <laughs> you know, it was expected of you. Um, it's just, there, there was a community no matter where you went. So I could go to San Francisco and there'd be a community of black folks in San Francisco that I could slide right into. I'd go to Oakland, oh my God, Oakland. I went to school in, at Cal State Hayward, so I eventually lived in Oakland. And that community was very, very heavily uh, militant because the Black Panther Party was very active during my school years. And we did a lot of things that were good and hardly any of the bad stuff. Um, you know, started free breakfast programs, free food giveaway, I helped with the food giveaways, uh, the free clinics, you know, the free preschools for the kids, you know. We can't expect the public school system to educate our children. That's our job. So, I never learned this in school. No, you did not. Okay, that's why you have libraries. <laughs> okay, and that's why you have elders. Uh, an elder is a library. So you need to know who to talk to, you need to know what to read, and you need to know where to go and where not to go. <sighs> we had fabulous music. Our music was inspirational. It was either about being in love or coming out of love or being in the revolution. Um, but you could understand the words. They, they spoke slow enough for you. <laughs> You know, I'm sure some of the rap stuff now is really good. I just, I just can't go that fast. <laughs> I can't process it. Um, and I have several nephews who are, you know, Auntie, I'm going to be a rapper. Oh, sweetie. <laughs> but, you know, Gil Scott Heron was a rapper. <laughs> okay. Um, the last poets were rappers. So, okay. Rappers don't have to have a bad rap. I hate to say that word. But when you start calling people those derogatory names that the other people used to call us. No, that, now that's the part that you're going to have to clean up your act. Mm -hmm. So, life was exciting. Um, I remember challenging, when I went to Cal State Hayward, I would often be one of the only black persons in the classroom or there would be a couple of, if I could convince my friends to take a class with me, <laughs> then we'd go in as a group. But if I couldn't, then I'd have to be the only one sitting. I was a sociology major. Actually, I was a social psych major, but they didn't have that. So I invented it. And um, I remember challenging instructors on, you. first of all, you said that two weeks ago. You have, you're giving me the same lecture. 
I paid a lot of money to be in this class. You need to educate me. I'm like, ooh. One of the instructors challenged me, well, Miss Spoos, if you think you can do a better job, I'll give you the podium. I said, all right, I'll be ready Friday. And so that class was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That was Monday, Friday, I gave my lecture, and he had to say in front of the class, I did a better job than he did. And that he was gonna have to up his game. I said, you got that right, or you gonna give me my money back. <laughs> so I think that was my real introduction to teaching. As you know, when you challenge the knowledge base of the professor standing in front of you, you better have a little more than he has. And I often did. Um, so that's school years. My family insisted that I be educated. And on my dad's side, uh, in each generation, there was a doctor of medicine, law, science, something. But And when I was born, they said I was the one. So all of my early years, I knew I was going to be Dr. Breeze. Uh, my dad was in med school, but he didn't, something happened and he didn't finish. And he went to law enforcement and then into social services. Um, so, but I like his medical knowledge because whenever something happened in the projects, they would come for Dr. Booz and he'd go with his little medical kit and go fix whatever it was. But one, <laughs> when I took the SAT, it destroyed my system so badly that I swore I would never take another standardized test. And when my little pod of friends were going to take the GRE, I was with them. I, I, I was in front. And I reached for the door and my arm paralyzed. It, it, it wouldn't go any further. <laughs> it's like, ooh. And they said, move out the way. And they went in, they took the test. I went home. I'm like, I didn't. I didn't. Ah. <laughs> you know? So I thought my formal education was over with my BA. And years later, I got a job at Pacific Oaks College as a lead teacher in the uh, child care program. And they said, oh, it's part of your benefits. You get to, you know, have free units for school. And I said, well, you know, I'm not taking a GRE, so I already have a BA. And that's it. And I said, no, you don't have to take the GRE. Are you all accredited? Oh, yes. Fully? Yes. By whom? WASC. Same WASC that does USC and UCLA? Yes. I'm like, oh, okay. But as a poor employee of that college, I couldn't afford to really enroll, so I took one class a semester as a special student. And then when I was in my last class, the admissions counselor said, you know, Regina, you can't graduate from a program you've never enrolled in. I said, well, that's true. Okay. Uh, enroll me. Well, you have to take um, a minimum of four units as a part-time student. I said, well, I only have three left. <laughs> so I had to make an exception for that. And I figured, if I can get a master's degree from a fully accredited college, I'm sure there's a doctoral program out there somewhere fully accredited too. And there was. The Fielding Institute, and I happily went on through there. Still challenging instructors, still having to write stuff for other people to say, I know this and you should too. <laughs> so that's how I became Dr. Breeze. And um, haven't really looked back since. <laughs> All right, so on one side of my family, on my father's side of the family, I am the right skin color. See these veins through there? On the other side of the family, my mother's side of the family, she and I and my sister are the wrong skin color. We cannot pass a paper bag test if God himself gave it to us, <laughs> okay? so. On her side of the family, um, she always tried to fit us into the family. It was really obvious that we didn't fit into the family, but we tried and she tried. Uh, when she died, we, I stopped trying. I don't need to fit in with you. And her grandmother, my great-grandmother, was talking to 
uh, one of her sons, and I was spend. My mom would make me go spend the summers in Maryland with those people, and she was talking to him. And said, there goes that half white thing right there. And I'm like, and I, I, I'm raised not to talk back to elders, but I'm ten, and I don't want to be there. And so I turn around and say to her, I am not half white. Both of my parents are African American. <laughs> and went on in the house. So I got spanked for that, but you know, I spoke my word. When I was growing up in um, Harrison Court, we were three project buildings on one block surrounded in my early years by a deeply Italian neighborhood. And so, coming off the block to go to Bluebell Market at the end of the second block meant I had to walk past the apartments of the Italian kids. And so I either got beat up on my way to the market and they stole my money, or I would get beaten up on my way home from the market and they would throw my groceries out in the street. Either way, I'd go home empty handed to a poor working mother who sent me to the store with all the money she had. So I have to come home saying, you're crying. I got you know beat up by the kids. I got spanked for that. So what I did was I learned never ever go to the market by yourself. And so I would go collect friends from our group and we would go to the market and then we would come home from the market. And that's how we all did get to the market and come back with our groceries intact. Um, my father was in, uh, he was a Kappa, so he was in school and he was in a fraternity. And since we didn't have childcare, he would take me when he was going over to the Kappa house. And my uncles taught me to box. Not, not girl fight, but box, <laughs> okay. So I became very proficient at protecting myself and others um, to the point where folks say, you know what, that one right there, she crazy, man, don't mess with her, don't mess with her. And every now and then somebody would try to mess with me just to see, and then get beaten down into a crumb and say, you're right, she crazy. So I got into very few fights because I was crazy. But the fights that I did get into, I can handle myself, okay. The Skin color and hair texture issue was always prevalent. And my normal hair is very wavy um, and it changes colors. And, and I have green eyes, I was born with blue eyes. They turned green when I was about six or seven. My mom took me to the doctor, the doctor told her that she didn't know what she was talking about because the eyes don't change colors. She said, I don't know what color my child's eyes were. My hair turns anything from blonde to dark auburn. It depends on how much sun I'm in. So I had issues with, you know, you got skin color, eye color, hair color. I bet you think you all that, don't you? I'm like, what? I'm not even thinking nothing. <laughs> I'm out of my own business. And that's how somebody would start a fight. You know, oh, you think you cute with those green eyes. Me? Uh, you got an issue. So I learned that these are not my issues. They are someone else's issues who are trying to project them onto me because they have low self-esteem. And they think, well, if I could beat up the cute girl over there, then I'll have higher self-esteem. Lo and behold, the cute girl over there just the snot out of you. So now you got even worse self-esteem because everybody saw it. <laughs> School-wise, I had teachers who did not like black students and they hated smart black students or in their vernacular. Oh, you think you're in a ass black man. My dad was in school, same time I was in. I'm telling you, my fifth grade teacher did the worst thing than I can think of in my whole entire school years. So, there's three of us who sat at the back of the class. Me, <laughs> Joyce, and Delmar. And we were the three black kids in the class. 
full of Italians, including Mr. Sarigas. So, um, my dad had been doing homework that night, or the night before, and he had, uh, he was doing math algebra. And so he said, look, I can show you how to add alphabets. I'm like, what? Alphabets? Now, in fifth grade, I was, um, nine because I had been double promoted. So I'm, I'm young and I'm also, no matter how light I am, I'm still black. So we're starting algebra in fifth grade and Mr. Sarigas is talking to the rest of the class and he said, I don't even bother with y'all. You, you, you can't even do this. You don't even know this. And I raised my hand and I'm sitting between Joyce and Delmar and they look at me like, oh, Regina, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Sarigas. I know how to do algebra. Oh, you think you do? Well, why don't you just come up here and show us? And he leaned back and put his feet up on the desk. <laughs> okay. So I went up to the board and I did the little equation my dad showed me. And I turned around smiling. And first thing I saw was Delmar and Joyce had their heads down like this. And I'm standing there like this, you know, like, hmm. <laughs> smiling at him. He says, well, and he takes his feet off the desk and says, I'll be damned. There's living proof. You can teach monkeys and monkeys to do tricks. And I'm like, and the class starts laughing. And, you know, paralyzed arm again. And that was the first paralyzed arm I had. I didn't know how to put the chalk down. It was still standing in my hand. And he said, go on, put the chalk down. Go on, go on, sit it back down. And all the way down, people sticking their feet out in their aisles, you know, trying to trip me. And I get back to my seat, and they, they won't even look at me. They just turn their head. And for the rest of the semester, that man didn't say another word to the three of us. He talked to the front of the class. He did not teach to the back of the class. Now, it took me a long time. I, I, I blocked that memory. And... I was terrible at math from that point on, but I didn't know why, because I had blocked that memory. And I was outstanding in reading and everything else, but that, it wasn't until I got to Pacific Oaks College, I was sitting in my social and political context class, and we had to tell a story from, you know, childhood, and that story just popped out. And I'm crying, the whole class is crying, the teacher's crying, everybody's apologizing. And I'm like, well, you all weren't there, yes, but it's just horrible. And, you know, and I, and I said, you know, and that's why, I'm, I guess that's why I'm bad at math. And so one of the students, a white woman said, why do you let him win? I'm like, what? Don't let him win. You can be better at math. I'm like, you know what, you're right. I got myself a fifth grade math book and taught myself all, everything I was supposed to have learned in there. Like, to you, Mr. Sarigas. <laughs> so, the more I told that story, the less pain it has. And so, like, right now, I have no pain in telling that story. But it took me a long time to be able to tell the story without crying. You know, because that, that was... First time I ever had a teacher cuss, and he was cussing at me. <laughs> so... Um, all the other stuff in school, I had an English teacher in high school who didn't believe I could read as fast as I could, and so she tested me in front of the class. We both had these readers, comprehensive readers, supposed to read it, write out the little thing on the back, and then post your time. And so when she finished hers, when she looked up, she was looking at me, because I had been finished. <laughs> she did not pass me in that class. And I would turn in paperwork, you know, turn in my assignments, I get an F on the assignments, and I started thinking about, hmm, I wonder. So I gave my friend an assignment, turn in, she got an A on the assignment. I said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. So I got to get the hell up out of this school, because <laughs> these people are gonna kill me. <laughs> and the moment I transferred to a, and that was the thing, they weren't gonna give me a transfer. My mother came up, my mother was five foot two, petite. She came up with, a can of lighter fluid and a book of matches. And she started spraying the school and flipping, I learned how to flip matches from my mom. <laughs> Starting fires, ma'am, no, no. She said, you're gonna transfer my daughter. 
So I had to go to a non-district school, which was Lucy Flower Vocational School on the far west side. I meant bus or however I could get there. And it was vocational. So there were 25 of us who got together and we put a college prep uh, program together in that school. And we graduated college prep and went to college. <laughs> okay. So you, know, you can't stop me. Like the old folks in Brooklyn said, you can't stop that child. <laughs> She's going to find a way. <laughs> I am, on the one hand, I'm hopeful, and on the other hand, I'm very sad. We, we are killing ourselves at a rate that is just, we don't even need the Klan anymore. Just wipe our own selves out. We do that work for them. And the, it, it seems like a lack of respect for us as a people, by us as a people. But on the other hand, I see uh, young people coming together now for um, struggles. You know, it, it has to be somebody. It has to be a catalyst. So, you know, the Black Lives Movement, um, they are up and running and moving closer and closer to some of the old uh, revolutionary movements that we had when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, I would like to see a difference in the type of music our children are listening to because I think that also generates the disrespect and the lack of life. If, you, if your song is, you know, I got, you know, my gun and I'm killing up all these people over here, then, you know, that's what you sing, you know, uh, and that's what you think is acceptable. I see too much violence in video games. I'm not blaming the video games. I blame the parents that buy these games and allow their children to play it. Okay, uh, This is a capitalistic society and uh, supply begets demand, demand begets supply. So I spend time with children who play video games day and night and all I can hear is gunshots. You know, I'm like, you just need to step outside, <laughs> you know, in your community. That's all you're going to hear because that's all your community is knowing, that this is how we play. And I had a conversation with my cousin, and she said, well, you know, we used to play, you know, cops and robbers, uh, cowboys and Indians. I said, yes, but <laughs> okay, that's not all we played. And I told you earlier about, you know, our snowball fights with rocks in them. You know, yeah, we did that. But that's not all we did. You know, we, we had a lot of imagination. When I was growing up, I wanted my own library because I, when I borrowed the books that were due back in two weeks, by the, the end of the two weeks, I was personal friends with these books, and they needed to stay at my house. So one of the goals that I had in childhood, I had three. I wanted to have my own library. I wanted to go to Disneyland, and I wanted to grow up and take care of my mother. And I did all three. Um, when I was in high school at Lucy Flower, I was a junior librarian. So I worked in the library because I, now I have all these books. And as you know, before COVID shut us down, Tracy and I were about to volunteer at this library. <laughs> yeah. um, but reading was such an important part of my life my friends read, you know, even, even in the projects, you know, they would come to my house and borrow books, you know, that had nothing to do with school. And I had a, a sense of wonderment about me. I wonder about things. I wonder where this goes. I wonder how this, I will take the path less travel because I wonder where it goes. Uh, my parents, we were poor. My parents would take us out to the uh, loading docks at the, in the Chicago port, and we would look at all the ships and watch them, you know, unload stuff. And my dad was taking German for his language in college, and we got aboard a German um, freighter because my dad spoke to the captain in German. Now, I do know Schwarzer means black. <laughs> okay, so the captain says something and then said something about black, and he probably said, look at these black folks speaking German. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we got to go on and wander around and stuff. 
or we would go to the airport, Midway Airport was within the city, and watch the planes taking off or you know coming in and wonder where they were going or where they had been. So I always had this um, lust for travel, and I did. I had a passport as soon as I could get one. And Debbie and I were, uh, we were being sent back and forth each summer to Washington, D.C. I think I, I remember my first flight when I was eight and she was four. So that has always been a, a large part of my life, travel, um, books. And I wanted to see if what I had read about was there, you know. So like when I went to... Um, Belgium. I wanted to know about Belgian chocolates, <laughs> you know, or I wanted to see the Maniki de Peace, you know, the little peeing boy that peed on the, on the um, premier, you know. So every place I went, I read up about way before, and that sort of um, determined my traveling path, and um, I am well traveled. <laughs> Stay registered to vote. You don't have to like the candidates. That's what I'm telling you. Uh, I grew up not that far away from when our folks could not vote. Okay, So it has been, always been important in our family that you are registered to vote. It doesn't matter if you want to vote or not. If you're not registered, you cannot vote. Now, if you don't like the candidates run for office. You could do it. You know, I am so in love with Stacey Abrams. You know, everybody laughed at me about moving to Georgia from California. Oh, girl, you're going down south. You know how the south is. Well, I haven't really found it as it used to be, and I'm liking the way it's going in terms of um, it's just really nice to see candidates who look like me. <laughs> you know, or I think I'm a lot darker than I am, so you know what I mean. But Stacey Abrams, I, I, I think the election was stolen from her. But anyway, she didn't sit down and go away like everybody thought she would. She said, oh, no, we're going to fix this. And she started a voter registration campaign that now everybody's like, uh, we got to do something about that because, no, <laughs> you see what she did? That's why Trump couldn't believe that Georgia didn't vote for him. <laughs> He promised me. Yeah, well, you know what? Stacy promised us. And we went out there and we showed you what registered voters can do. And so, if you don't register, you can't vote. If you don't show up, you can't complain about, well, I didn't like him anyway. Well, you know what? The problem that I deal with is when people talk about, well, voting for the lesser of two evils. All right, their operative word is lesser. My operative word is evil. <laughs> okay, and when I was in my early 20s, I would vote for Mickey Mouse if I didn't like the candidate. And a couple times I wrote my own name in until I decided maybe the government will come get me, so stop doing that. But I pay attention to what the campaign promises are of each party, not each person, but each party, the whole party, because when you vote for one person, you are voting for that person's party. And once upon a time, the Republicans were the party of our people, and then somewhere, and the Democrats were horrible, terrible Klan's people. Okay, so now the Democrats are the party of our people, and the Republicans are the terrible, horrible, no good Klan's people. Okay, well guess what? They are the parties parties of the elites. And so if you really want to see change, it has to be the grassroots who say, look, there will be no grass <laughs> if you all don't take care of us. Okay, Grass cannot grow without its roots. It can't. So a good example of that is uh, this GameStop. Everybody went out and bought stock in GameStop to the point where Wall Street shut it down, shut off the trading because they were losing money because they had bet the game stock would close and go away. 
and everybody's out there who games went out there and bought some GameStop. <laughs> okay, that's a lot of people with a lot of money. We have the money, we just don't use it in a way that will benefit us. When you talk about, we need reparations, we have reparations. I moved from California and bought a home with property. That's reparations for me. Okay. And I can afford to live in that house without worrying about, oh my God, oh my God, can I, you know, they're gonna come and take it from me. No, they're not. Because I bought that house. I saved my money and bought that house. When I went into the bank for the bank loan, I had been with that bank for 40 years. They knew how much money I had. And my point is, you will give me a bank loan or I will take all of my money and go to another bank. Uh, oh, uh, Dr. Booz, where do you want? <laughs> how soon can we get this to you? Uh-huh, that's what I thought. <laughs> so this is, you, you have the ability to pool our money, and I said our money, you know. We, we get mad at people who do that. Oh, they come in here and they buy up everything. Yes, you know why? Because they pooled their money. This house goes to that family. This house goes to this family. This house goes. You have to wait your turn. You can't be first. Unless you put up first money, then you can't be. And it all goes back to what? Registering to vote. Understanding how taxes work means being able to vote somebody in who's going to represent you. Property tax, you voted those people in. Okay, when they decide to raise the taxes, remember those are your representatives. They're supposed to be working for you. So stay registered, stay knowledgeable, read. Forget the internet, read a book. Okay, come to a library, it's free. And on that, thank you for listening.